turn to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, not too long ago, but a little while ago, I preached a series called Who Are We at CFC? What are we like? What's our personality? What's our calling from God? And one of the first things we dealt with in that series was that we are a Bible church. And uh, we had some uh, people move to town not too long ago, and I was chatting with them and, and uh, you know, told them I was a pastor. And they said, well, what, you know, what church do you pastor? I said, well, it's Christian Fellowship Church. And they said, what kind of church is it? Well, that's a really hard question to answer, <laughs> you know. So what I always start with is we're a Bible church because we believe the Bible. We believe what it says. We believe it that it is superior to any other word uh, that you may receive from anybody. Because God's word is the standard by which we measure even the spirits that speak through people. Because if there is a spirit that speaks through a person and it contradicts God's word, that was not the Holy Spirit. It was some other kind of spirit you want to have anything to do with. But like I've said many times on various occasions, you need to make sure you stay out of the ditch. Anybody remember me ever saying that? A couple of you. Good. Because I said that and, I, and then all of a sudden I was like, have I ever said that? I hope I've said that. Because, okay, all right. It's very easy for people to get in the ditch on one side or another of an argument, and both sides, even though they look opposite of each other, are very similar to each other in the fact that they're wrong. And it is possible to be too much a Bible church. Now, I know that sounds like, what, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, just follow with me here, and you'll see what I'm talking about. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we'll start with verse 1. <clears throat> And uh, I don't want to read out of the Amplified. I don't have the voice for it today. <laughs> We're going to read out of the New International. All right. Paul says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Verse 6, they are the kind who worm their way, in way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with with sin, by the way, the who is not the gullible women. It's talking about the same people. Who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Now, let's just take one through six. Can we agree that these are bad people? Can we agree on that? Bad people. Okay, these are bad people. However, look at verse seven. Always learning. Now, let's stop right there. When we read 2 Timothy chapter 3, we start in verse 1, we start developing a picture in our mind of the type of person Timothy's talking about. That person is unchurched, doesn't know the Bible, is uneducated in the ways of God, either by choice or, or by circumstance. Probably by choice, because bad people, they choose to be bad. And we get this image of this, of this individual who is rebellious against God. And everything that has to do, they wouldn't darken the door of a church. And yet, in verse 7, it says, these people are ever learning. And you say, well, yeah, okay, they went to college. I, you know, uh, they watch the History Channel. They're not learning about God. Look at the second half of the verse. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. You know what they're learning? About the truth. You want to know a picture of this person? This is the type of person that goes to every conference that's available. They're in church every time the door is open. They listen to sermons on Sunday morning. They read their Bible every day. These are people, and let me show you why. Look at the very beginning of that verse, verse 7. Always learning. Uh, I, I want to, oh, you know what? I'm getting way ahead of myself. I'm getting too excited. Let, we'll get to the Greek here in just a second. In order to, let me ask you a question. How can someone be ever learning about the truth and never come to an understanding of that truth? How is that possible? Well, in order to answer that question, let me ask you another. What is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? 42, correct. But for those of you who don't get that joke, don't worry about it. For the rest of us that do, nerds unite. Uh, the <laughs> it's from a book, a very nerdy book. Okay, the answer to life, the universe, and everything 
is Jesus, right? Uh, he's the answer. But that's not the answer you get. When you ask people what's the answer to all things, there are different camps. The materialist will say the answer to life is abundance so that we will never lack anything. Unfortunately, all you have to do is ask individuals who have an abundance, are you satisfied? And the answer is, well, no. How many more billions will you need to be satisfied? I love one answer. <laughs> Somebody said, I don't need billions to be satisfied. I just need a coffin. <laughs> I thought, what a great way to put that. You're never satisfied with material until you're dead and you can't use it anymore. So materialism doesn't work. It, it's an answer that people use, but it doesn't actually answer the question. Then there's the existentialist. Materialism, um, well, it goes way back. But existentialism really started forming in European and Western society uh, in the 1800s, and it became really popular in the 1960s. Existentialism comes from the word exist. It is the idea that experience is the key to all things, that if you have good experiences, whether they be, you know, mountain climbing, a beautiful vista, a good marriage, uh, wonderful kids, I mean, but it's the experience that is the answer to all things, positive experiences. Well, ask King uh, Solomon how that worked out for him. <laughs> he called it a blowing of the wind. Then, of course, there's the minimalist. Now, they've been around for millennium. And the minimalist says the answer to everything is nothing. The, the less you can have, then you can control your desires to the point where you don't want anything, and then you'll be happy. Only I've known many people that have tried to adhere to this doctrine, and you know what? They're not happy. You know why? Because they're hungry. These people are hungry all the time. And I don't know about you, but your body is not designed to be hungry all the time. You make it hungry all the time, it starts kicking you. Okay? So I remember... I had a student that, um, well, he didn't want to be a Christian for personal reasons, not because he didn't believe in God, but he decided to become a Buddhist, and he actually went through all the training, and I remember he lost a lot of weight. He wasn't a, he wasn't a big guy, but he had a little bit of a belly. He was like this tall, and uh, I remember he, um, he went to, I, I don't think he went to Tibet, but he went to like all the other places and studied Buddhism, became a Buddhist monk, and, and lost a bunch of weight. Then he stopped, and they said, we need you to go to Tibet and do this final training four years in Tibet. And he said, you know, I don't think I'm going to do that. <laughs> I love you guys, but no. And all of a sudden he started gaining weight. And I remember asking him one time on Facebook, because I did finally find him. I said, what, you know, what, where's all this weight coming from? And he just gave me a winky face. Because he figured out that nothing isn't a solution either. So having a lot isn't a solution. Having nothing isn't a solution. And experiencing life isn't a solution. Now, there's another solution that humankind like to throw out when you say, what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? And it's the one that America adheres to the most, or at least did in its past. And it's the rationalist. The rationalist says that learning is the key to everything so that you will understand everything that happens. Rationalism actually started back in the Renaissance, well, the rebirth of rationalism did. It existed in the Greeks, uh, Greek culture too, but it was rebirthed in Europe during the Renaissance. And uh, everyone started learning again. They started experimenting, trying new things. People started to learn how to read. Nobody could read before then. And all these, um, uh, uh, well, you call them vulgar languages, but it's not what it sounds like. All of the common languages, the non-Latin languages, Italian and, and German and English, all of these languages, they started writing them down with a Latin alphabet so that people could learn how to read. And then the Enlightenment came after the Renaissance where rational thought became the key to the universe. And science went along with it. If we could just think well enough and deep enough and hard enough, we can come to a fulfilling solution to our problem of lack of fulfillment. Because that's the, that's the human condition. We live unfulfilled. And it's the brokenness in our flesh, the separation from God that creates that. But they didn't like that. They, this was also during the time when evolution became a popular concept because it was a rational way, well, so they said, it is a rational way to explain away God. And so this rationalist said, if we can just learn enough, and Luther was it, very, very early on in this stuff. Luther started his reformation against the church. And his answer was, if you cannot prove to me through the scriptures and sound reason. 
Now, I got nothing against Luther. He was a good guy. He had a few problems, like being a racist. But, you know, he, had, he, he, had, he did a lot of good. And one of the, but one of his problems was he attached to Scripture the idea of rationalism because that was popular in his day. So now all these people are reading the Bible in German and other languages, and they're, they're interpreting it for, them, for themselves, and it caused great things. Revival started to sweep through Europe, and all these people started to come to Christ and changing their life, and it was great. And, and then they started killing each other over it. Then they started murdering kings and princes and priests in the street, torturing people to death over this. And the, the Catholic Church would persecute the reformers, and then when the reformers got power, they persecuted the Catholics. Now, I don't know if you missed it or not, but one of the things that Jesus had to say in this Bible that they were reading is that you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. I don't want to be tortured. Now, maybe you guys are into that. I don't know. I don't want to be tortured. So I'm not going to torture anybody else because my Jesus in the Bible that these people are reading for the first time says, treat others the way you want to be treated. How did they miss that? Because they were ever learning, never able to come to an understanding of the truth. How is that possible? Now, I got nothing against learning. I was an educator for five years. My main gifting is in uh, uh, teaching and preaching. And so, you know, I love learning. In fact, Paul does too. Go back to your text. In verse 10, he says, However, you, however, know all about my teachings. In verse 14, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned. In verse 15, it says, And how from infancy you have known the scriptures which, can, which are able to make you wise. Paul's not against education. He's not against information. In fact, verse 16, he says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In other words, there's nothing wrong with teaching. Teaching is an important, vital part of our walk with Christ. But what are you hanging your hopes on? What are you relying on to fulfill you? The question that this sermon came from uh, years ago. I was, uh, I was worshiping and, and I remember I was thinking, uh, God showed me something and I said, oh, that's great. I can't wait to teach it to the, to the congregation. And he said, are you a Bible church? Do you love God's word or do you just love knowing God's word? And I remember thinking, well, that's kind of strange. I wrote it down and I pondered and I said, God, that's the same thing. You can't love your word without, I mean, you, you can't love knowing your word without loving your word. And he said, oh, yes, you can. He said, there are people that know my word better than you do, and they don't even believe in Jesus. He said, it's very easy to love knowing my word without loving my word. So how do people who are ever learning remain never understanding? You know, learning isn't useless, but it isn't the answer. You guys, um, some of you may remember this, some, some of you aren't old enough, uh, I'm not, so I don't, but um, in the 19, uh, late 1950s, moving into the 1960s, there was a problem in our culture. Unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, and all these problems started to show up in our culture. So what did they do? We need to teach the kids about this. If we teach the kids about this, they'll behave. So they taught the kids about it. Did it change anything? No, it got worse, didn't it? And so they said, well, we need to teach them more. So then they got more graphic, and they started teaching them more details and using other words. Did it fix the problem? No. Then I come along <laughs> in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and now it was teach them earlier. Well, we're just not teaching them early enough. That's what the problem is. We need to start when they're 14, when they're 13, when they're 12, when they're 10. You know how house early they're starting teaching kids about this stuff? Way before they're ready to handle it. But why are they doing it? Because it's the only solution they have. They can't say Jesus is the answer to this problem. So what do they do? Education. Education will solve it. You know, we have an, an economic problem in our society right now, in, in America, in our country, all over the world, but in our country too. And uh, I remember, <laughs> I'm waxing political all the time today. Uh, I remember he said, uh, uh, President Obama got on and he said, you know, to solve our economy, we've got to make higher education available to more people. And I thought, okay, all right, I'm not a genius, but um, so you're going to send more people to college so they can get jobs that aren't there? 
The problem isn't a lack of education, the problem is a lack of jobs. You can't solve joblessness with education. It doesn't work. Just like you can't solve immorality with education. It has to be solved with Jesus. And so what happens is these people love learning. And I know you guys love learning. I tell other pastors how long my sermons are, and they go, how do they put up with you? I told Adam one time, I said, if I preach a sermon as long as yours, they cut my pay. <laughs> you know, you guys love to learn. I'm not putting you in this camp, but I want to warn you. Because loving to learn is great. But if, lo if learning is your goal, if learning is what you're going for, if learning is what you're resting your satisfaction and even your salvation on, you're going to come up short. And one of the biggest problems is that our country, the, our culture as the United States, was based during the Enlightenment. That means a lot of our focus as a culture is on reason, understanding, and learning. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things. I love those things. I call myself a couch intellectual because I don't want to get off my couch to learn. So I'll stay on my couch and learn. But I love to learn, okay? I got nothing against that. But when you, when you rest your hopes on it, when you rely on it, here's one for you. Sunday school, not going to save your kids. Not going to save your grandkids. It can help them, but it's not going to do it. Only Jesus can do it. Education is not the answer. It is a help to the answer, but it's not the answer. Now, go back to verse 7. I want to show you some of the Greek here. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of Greek. Okay, verse 7. These people are always learning. The word always is also translated ever in some of your, in some of your uh, translations. It's the Greek word pantote. And pantote literally means every win. It's a compound word. Every win. In other words, whenever there's a win, that's when it happens. So at all times, every opportunity, kind of like... Um, well, I don't do it anymore, but you know, you, you, you take a bowl of M&Ms and you set it on a counter and every win you pass by, you take one. <laughs> I don't even put them out anymore for that reason, because every, every opportunity I have, I take it, right? That's what this word means, at every possible opportunity. These are the ones that, oh, oh, we're taking a trip to go see Jesse Plants, I'm there. Oh, oh, pass. Is going to have a Sunday night study? I'm there. Oh, Sunday school starting? I'm there. Uh, So-and-so's preaching on the TV? I'm there. And they're always in the learning. And yet somehow their life never seems to get better. How? Because they're ever learning. But here we go on to the next part. The word never there and never understanding or never coming to an understanding of the truth is the Greek word medepote. And medepote, I love this, you know, Strong's is usually fairly succinct and it usually just sounds, well, it's uh, complicated, but uh, it sounds like a little kid in this one. The actual definition in Strong's Concordance is not even ever. <laughs> Can you just hear a little kid? When are you going to loan me your skates? Not even ever. <laughs> you can just hear them just saying it's never going to happen. Not even ever, 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 never. That's what this word, that's the indication that this word has, like a, like a, this, it is not only never going to happen, it ain't ever, ever going to happen, okay? So these people are at every possible opportunity learning, but never, ever, not even, ever impossible that they what? What? Okay, all right. thought I said something wrong again. I've been doing that a lot today. Uh, they are not even, ever doing what? Coming, that word means to arrive. It can be both physical and, uh, and um, less literal, figurative. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> they are always learning, but never able to come to, to arrive to the knowledge. Now, remember, I've been talking about information, knowledge, but here's the actual translation of that word. It is epignosis. Now, you might recognize the word gnosis in there because it comes from the word for knowledge, okay? But the prefix, ipi, I guess, I don't know, uh, that comes before the word gnosis changes the word to this. Recognition. Recognition. Understanding, which is different than knowledge or information. And this was my favorite. Acknowledgement. You see, epignosis is not gnosis. In gnosis, I know something with my mind. But if it's epignosis, now not only do I know it, but I recognize it for what it is. 
I understand how it works, and I acknowledge that it is true. That's the difference. Because there are people who love to learn God's Word, but they don't ever understand what it says, they don't ever recognize it, or they never acknowledge it as the, as the truth. At least they might do it with their mouth, but they never do it with their life. Oh, God's Word says that I need to love my neighbor. Great! Now I know what God's Word says. But then your neighbor does something you don't like, and then it's like, I'll get you. What happened? Well, you were learning, but you weren't understanding. You had gnosis, but you didn't have epignosis. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Selena. <laughs> That's an inside joke for me and Kara, sorry. So these individuals, despite the constant unending flood of information coming their way, we could say this about them. It is not even ever possible that they ever arrive at the comprehension and acknowledgement of the truth. Because knowledge is not the same as information, or knowledge is not the same as wisdom. In fact, knowledge can be dangerous. The, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that, uh, that knowledge puffs up. The word there means to be inflated like a balloon. But love builds up like a solid, sturdy building. So you got two options. You can either puff up your head or you can build yourself up so you're strong. Well, what happens to a person when temptations come against them and they're just a big balloon? They're going to get blown away. But if they're a solid, sturdy foundation brick house, they're going to stand firm. That's the difference. Here's something interesting. Knowledge can also ruin you this way. Because, well, it's the same way, but I'm just going to word it differently. When your head gets big, you have what they, they call a big ego. And a, big, a person with a big ego can be called an egoist. And an egoist does something fascinating. They don't love. You ever notice that? Someone with a big ego is lacking in love. That's why it's important that if you find someone who has love and you think they have a big ego, check yourself. Because a person with a big ego can't be loving. Because loving is thinking about somebody else and egoists is thinking about themselves. So these people who are ever learning, not only do they not come to an understanding of the truth, but they can't because the truth says love and their heads are so big and they're so focused on themselves. They're wandering around going, I am so powerful in, in information and knowledge that you should all bow at my feet and listen to what I have to say. You ever met somebody like that? I used to be like that. So I know from experience what that, don't you nod over here. <laughs> Oh, okay, I thought I caught you nodding your head. It, I, she met me like that. She knows, she knows the truth. She was there. She's a witness. But here's what's interesting. An egoist, as big and proud and strong as they may look on the face of things, are actually weak when it comes to temptation. Because the only way to really overcome temptation is with love, whether it be love for the other person so you don't sin against them, or love for God so you don't sin against Him. So an egoist, someone who has much knowledge, is someone who's actually weaker when it comes to their walk with Christ. In fact, go back to verse 1 of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's take a look at this person one more time. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be, what? Lovers of themselves. People will be egoists. Kind of like that. Because I don't think there's been as many egoists in the world as there is today. Because there's a lot of information out there to puff people's heads up. A lot more than there used to be. And so all these people are getting puffed up heads and it's like, ah, the last days are coming. Take me home. <laughs> what else though? They're lovers of themselves. They're lovers of money. Why is an egoist a lover of money? Because I'm worth it. I'm worth having lots of money because I'm so knowledgeable. They're obviously boastful, that one goes without saying. Proud, that one's easy. But abusive, why would they be abusive? You're not as important as I am. Therefore, I will treat you as less than myself. Because they have a big ego. What else are they? Disobedient to their parents? Well, my parents are great people, but they don't know anything. Yeah, I can say that, that I used to actually feel that way. <laughs> oh, man. What else? Ungrateful? Well, of course you gave it to me. That is what I'm worth. Unholy? Even God can't convince these people. Without love, we've already talked about that. Unforgiving because 
I'm better than you. There's no need for me to forgive you because I'm obviously superior to you. Slanderous, always talking down about other people because they're so important. Without self-control, why would I need to control myself? I'm so perfect. Everything I want and feel must be perfect. So why would I need self-control? Brutal, lover, not lovers of the good. Even though they know what good is, they don't love the good because they only love themselves. Treacherous, rash, conceited, and eventually lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And then I like verse 5, having a form of godliness, looking important, but denying the power of a changed life. Does that not describe the person who's ever learning, but never coming to an understanding? Christian Fellowship Church is a word church. We are a Bible church. And I will always start with that because I am not going to apologize for trusting the only book that's been right every time. Okay? Just statistically speaking, the Bible's better than any book that's ever been written. So I'm going to put my trust and faith in that, and I'm never going to apologize for that. But we have to be careful that knowing doesn't become the purpose. Let me give you an example. Why do you come to church? And I know I ask you guys this all the time, and I'm always kicking this dog, but listen carefully to what I'm saying. Why do you come to church? Is it to hear me preach? Then Gosh, I'm sorry, that's pretty pitiful. Why would you come and get up on a Sunday morning all the way to listen to some, you know, idiot rant for 30 minutes? See, Tim knows what I'm talking about. Present. Yeah, present. Uh, why, why would you do that? Because I want to learn. I want to learn what God's Word says. Well, there's nothing wrong with learning. But if that's why you're here, you're missing the point. I'm not here because... I get to listen to a sermon. Okay, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> Kara's not here to listen to a sermon. She's here because God's here. She's here because Jesus is here. And she wants to meet with him. That's why we should be together. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get up in the morning and say, you know, I really don't want to listen to the sermon, so I'm going to go to church and tell Pastor Mikey because I'm not going to leave. I mean, you can. I don't care. But that, you know, I don't want you to go that route. The point is... What are you focusing on? What are you relying on? What are you wanting to fulfill the emptiness inside of you? And if it's education, if it's learning, if it's information, you're going to miss out. And not only is it not going to fulfill you, it's going to destroy you. You know, going to Sunday school isn't going to fix your problem. But obeying what you learn in Sunday school can. You know, knowing what the Bible says isn't going to solve your problem. But believing it with your heart will. The Bible says it is with our heart that we believe. Watching preachers on TV isn't going to solve your problem. But using the sermons that they speak with to improve your relationship with God really can. And I like this one. Knowing your theological answers to people's questions isn't going to solve your problem. Only knowing the Spirit will. That one hits real close to home to me because I like knowing my answers. And the Bible says, be ready to give an answer in season and out. So you need to know your answers. I'm not saying don't pay attention to theology. What I'm saying is this. If you're relying on your arguments to change somebody's mind and bring them to the Lord, you're going to lose. You have to know the Spirit who tells you what to say, when to say. You know, this it's not on here. That's kind of odd. Um, maybe this is an older version. Uh... God showed me something the other day, and it just, it hit me so hard. I'm lying in bed trying to go to sleep, and it's like, oh, I got to write that down. But my phone was already off, and Kara was up. So I went over, and I said, Kara, give me your phone. I want to write this down. So she said, well, just text it to yourself. Somehow I ended up texting it to Denise. I must have been a little more asleep than I thought. Um, but somehow it went to the wrong person. But it basically said this. You can't, people believe what they want to believe. Okay, if somebody doesn't want to believe in God, they're not going to believe in God no matter what kind of arguments you give them. You can't convince someone to change their mind because of, their, because of arguments and information. If you want to change what somebody believes, you have to change what they want to believe. And that's what God does with your circumstances. Somebody is living rebellious against God and all of a sudden this tidal wave hits them. And he says, come to me. And it changes what you want to believe. You might be believing before then, ah, me and God, we're fine. I don't have to have anything to do with them. We'll just see him in heaven. You might be believing that. 
And somebody says, you need to have a relationship with him. No, no, I, you know, I, I'm fine. The Bible said, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. The arguments say, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. But then circumstances hit him and God says, come to me. And suddenly what they want to believe is changed. Knowing your arguments is great, but don't expect to win with them. That's a tough one for me to learn because I was a debate coach. <laughs> yeah, but, you, but ultimately knowing the spirit is the answer. Because the Spirit can tell you what the person needs to hear. I remember um, we, at this seminar we went to yesterday, it was tremendous, and I can't wait to share with you guys what he said, but um, he was talking about asking powerful questions and having powerful conversations with people, conversations that are two minutes long but change their life. I was like, yeah, I want to do that, I want to do that. You know what his first thing was? He didn't say it this way, but it was basically, shut up. What? I want to change their life, i got to give them information. No, shut up. Stop talking. Let them talk. Ask a question and let them talk. I'm not, how many of you know I'm not very good at that? Anybody willing to admit that to everybody else? Tim's the only one willing to admit it and his kids. Okay, fine. And my kids. Uh, you know, there's something I need to grow in. But you can't change somebody's life with arguments and information. You can only change it with the heart of God, with the Spirit of God. And so knowing your theological answers isn't a solution. Only knowing the Spirit is. We need to be wary because we have an adversary. And he is out to get you and to stop you from doing anything good ever. And he will even use the word of God to do it. And he's tricky enough to accomplish that. We need to be careful as CFC that information does not become our God. That learning does not become our idol. But that instead we use it as a tool to improve our relationship with God. Amen? Thank you for that resounding amen. Everyone's like, I don't know, Pastor, I'm going to have to chew on that for a little while. All right. Let's go ahead and close with prayer. Father, thank you that you have given us your word, your wisdom written down for us to understand. But Lord, more importantly, I thank you for your spirit that you've left us to enlighten us, to, to reveal to us what it means and how to apply it to our lives. And Father, I pray that each of us would put our trust and faith in you and not just your word that we would rely on your spirit that you've given us and not just the information. Thank you, Father. And help us to, to treat others <clears throat> with the love and compassion that Jesus used with the people in his day, that we might turn many back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Micah Howry of the Christian Fellowship Church of Hoxie. Here's some upcoming events at CFC, and if you'd like more information about them, you can visit our website at www.hoxiechristianfellowship.com.
Hey, on the pipe organ, laying it down. Everybody knows I run this town. Throw me a mic and I might surprise ya. Meet me at the water and I'll baptize ya. Yo, wait for my signal. Now bust out the hymnal. Back to church, we going back to church. Put the fam in the van, man. Back to church. Back to church, we going back to church. Everybody in the nation, find a location. Back to church, we going back. Yo, I get it. It's been a while, maybe a small church is more your style. Trust me, you'll be glad you came. Like cheers, everybody knows your name. I'm not here to judge or nitpick. Just get down to the church picnic. Back to church, it's a celebration. What you waiting for? Here's your invitation. Oh. Now I hope that you're ready. Cause when daddy hit the stage, it's about to get sweaty. We get wild. When I flow like the Nile, got you dancing in the aisle saying, ooh, child. Now please, somebody, where your hanky at me? And can I get an amen from the back seat? Amen. Back to church Sunday, it's not a rumor, main time for a comeback. Boomerang. Back 